to the October 2020 UARC meeting. Let's see here. Um, we have uh, 33 watching this at the moment. And remember that you can make comments on the YouTube chat. We are re somebody's reading that. I see Laird, uh, Chuck, KC7CO, uh, Mike, Denzi, uh, Paul, uh, and a few others. I'm trying to run two computers here, so I'm likely to miss somebody, and KE7QEQ as well. Uh, if you have any comments during the meeting, please say them in the uh, chat. Now, um, we've been doing technical stuff in getting everything set up before this, so I will give Gordon the heads up in just a moment about club announcements. Uh, Morse could not be here tonight, uh, so, uh, Gordon, uh, are you, uh, when you're unmuted, are you prepared to do some general announcements and information such as they are related to the club? Uh, uh, go ahead, Gordon, whenever you're ready. Uh, the only thing I can think of tonight is the Swaptoberfest coming up in Logan. But I'll be happy to give some details on that. Okay. All right. Uh, dig up those details, although um, when you can. Um, any change in the test sessions or do you know of anything since last month or just reiterate what we talked about last month? There's been no change that I know of. The only, uh, we've not been able to give any of the UARC sessions because of the uh, pandemic. They won't let us use our usual room. Uh, so uh, we recommend people use the Taylorsville session that happens on the last Monday of every month. Okay. And let's see, we have an election coming up. Have we decided what we're gonna do about that? Oh, are we supposed to do something about uh, the election? Um, by by according to the bylaws, yes. Uh, we were at our last board meeting, we discovered that there's nothing in our bylaws to really cover this eventuality. And we're still trying to figure out what it should be. Now, I guess at this point, would we present the list of candidates, uh, assuming that with the assumption that it'll, for the moment, it'll be the same as uh, what they are now, or what do we do, what do you suggest? Well, it's the November meeting where we need to show the, the list of candidates, which I don't think we've created yet. Okay. Uh, but if th this month would be a great time for anyone who wants to suggest the nomination, get in touch with one of the officers, and we can add that on the list. All right. So if you're out there and are interested in being a UARC officer, please email any one of the officers of the club and let us know what you have in mind, what you hope to bring to the club. And even if you aren't interested in, an, in being an officer, if you have any suggestions for programs or ideas on what the club might do, please, again, bring it to the attention of the officers, which is, suggestions are always welcome. Anyway, um, I think that's more or less it for the announcements. Uh, let's see, do we uh, know what next meeting, month's meeting topic will be? Uh, do you know, Gordon? You, you did the microvolt. Uh, no, this microvolt announced this uh, meeting. I have no idea what uh, November is. Okay, I don't have my meeting notes. Uh, Tom, do you remember what next month's meeting topic will be? It's it's in the minutes. I'll have to bring them up. Why don't you uh, take a pause, move on to the next thing. I'll see if I can find them. All right. Anyway, uh, so tonight's meeting is as usual for October, homebrew night, where people have built things that we can claim are amateur related and present them before everybody. 
Now, for, since everybody's stuck at home, I'm sure that everybody has built lots and lots of NEATO projects, right? But uh, even if not, if you have an old project, might be a bit now late now for uh, tonight's meeting, but we'll be doing this next year in October, hopefully in real life this time. But anyway, we have, uh, let's see, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hopefully seven presenters tonight with their various projects um, scattered all over the US. So one of the guys is in Louisiana, the other one's in Arizona, both UARC members. And we will uh, get to them shortly. Uh, Tom, uh, did you find the minutes yet? Indeed, indeedly doodly. Uh, <laughs> what I found, what we wrote down in our, uh, our last board meeting minutes, the, uh, the November meeting uh, currently is scheduled for Morris AD7SR will be presenting a presentation on elements of an amateur radio station. That's the, uh, that's the topic, elements of an amateur radio station. It's kind of geared towards uh, someone that uh, maybe they're getting into HF for the first time or uh, you know, they're, they're trying to get their station set up. And, uh, and it's, so, it's, so it's a little bit more towards the newly licensed uh, general class operator uh, that the presentation will go towards, but it's gonna be good. Uh, it should be a pretty good presentation nonetheless, even for people with technician or, or advanced class licenses like the extra and such. So that's, uh, that's what we captured in our last uh, meeting, uh, Clint. Okay, and speaking of Morris, uh, he's, since he's not here to speak for himself, I'll remind you that Morris is holding via Zoom um, class, amateur radio classes. So if you want to upgrade, uh, check the uh, UARC webpage and also contact Morris, uh, Alpha Delta 7, AD7SR, Alpha Delta 7 Sierra Romeo, AD7SR, um, and find out what the classes are. I believe he's holding classes during session, not right at the moment, of course, but uh, he's there is a class currently in progress, and there are usually different licensed classes, class coming up. So uh, if you want to upgrade, even in these times, go there. And of course, uh, with the sessions that Gordon mentioned, you should be able to take the exam either in person or maybe even remotely. Uh, I will have in the show notes on the YouTube video once this is all edited in the next day or two, the information regarding how to look up uh, one of the resources that we have from one of our local groups about the classes or the test sessions. All right, I think that about does the meeting here for the uh, business. Bruce, are you ready to take over? Yeah, I did find that Swaptoberfest. It's this Saturday up in Logan. Okay. And you go to tonight. the Bark, uh, hang on, I'll give you the website address. Bark or Barco or yeah, B A R C O N L I N E dot org. And they've got the information there as to where to go. Okay. And when it's going to be. But it's this Saturday. All right. And 9 a.m. in the city park in Logan. All right. Sounds good. 9 a.m. at the city park in Logan. So if you want to drive up there and do a chilly Cache Valley, then that's the place to go. Anyway, anytime you're ready to take it, Bruce, go ahead. Okay, so every year we have this really fun uh, meeting where the members get to present their different uh, things that they've been working on and projects. And I've seen anything from uh, leaf blowers to, to uh, ideas with antennas and, and that in this. So uh, Chuck Johnson, WA7JOS, has a project that uh, I'll let him introduce it. And go ahead, Chuck. Hi, I'm Chuck Johnson, WA7JOS. You are contents to add a beam antenna to the Lemington site. To that end, a remote controlled rotator will be necessary. I foolishly volunteered to head up that project. 
Having some experience with Arduino, I felt it was a suitable platform to achieve our needs. Glenn Popeil has written two books, soon to be three, on the subject of Arduino projects for ham radio. Among those projects are several instances of rotator controllers. Last spring we acquired a very nice Yaesu G2800 rotator. It is very beefy and can handle about 30 square feet of wind load. It offers 450 degree rotation and the controller has a convenient remote interface. It was missing the pointer and cover. Doug Bozen 3D printed me a new pointer. I used a CG, CD jewel case to make a new cover. I started this project with the Glenn Popeil program for the G800 controller and then modified it to meet our needs. Yesu offers a remote interface that's way expensive, $250, and it's RS-232. Who supports that anymore? The Popeil interface emulates its protocol using the native USB port on the Arduino. That means that RC4 and other remote interfaces already know how to talk to it. I added this prototype interface board with diagnostic LEDs and calibration switch. This relay board wasn't really needed, but I put it in anyway and added to the protocol to control it. This gives us four future functions, perhaps antenna selection. Over several weeks, I tweaked the program to deal with speed and overshoot issues. Here's the shield stack. When it was done, I put it in this fine 25 cent sandwich container and took it to Gary Crumb Station for testing. It worked perfectly. To use it, the new heading is entered into RC, the RC4 program. That command is transmitted to the interface. The controller moves it to that heading. That's it. Very easy and transparent. Installation awaits other infrastructure improvements. A base mount needs to be fabricated. A couple of sections of Rhone Tower installed to get above the horn antennas. And a beam purchased, assembled, and erected. This probably won't happen until 2021. Okay, that's it. That looks like a really cool project, and I know it's going to be make, make uh, the Lemington site even more util, or useful and, and functional for those that like to get on there and, and check things out. Uh, now we go to Blake, K8LSU. He's uh, oh, our resident hurricane watch down in uh, Baton Rouge. <laughs> so go ahead, Blake. Awesome. Um, so let me uh, share this with you guys real quick here. And you... I'm Blake Gonzalez, K8LSU. Um, actually, so as was mentioned with coronavirus, um, a lot of us have been bored at home, and uh, I haven't touched a ham radio since the 80s. And uh, back in March or April, I think I decided to, to get back with it and uh, got my general ticket a couple of months ago, my extra ticket a couple of weeks ago, and uh, enjoying it. I'm still hitting the guardrails, but this is my new rig. I'm happy. Obviously, a lot of you guys have, have seen an IC7300, um, and uh, that's my rig and my station real quick. So what I decided was, um, you know, I have my wife who has an office right next door to me, and you know, whenever I'm during the day and I'm trying to do some FT8 in the middle of the day while I'm trying to work or something, every time I transmit, uh, the, the IC7300, as great as a rig as it is, it, it makes a lot of noise. The fan noise is really, really, um, really, really loud. Um, I'd say 55 uh, dBA or so. Um, so I decided to go ahead and, and change out the fan. So uh, and this is a really simple project, easy for anybody to do that has an IC7300. Um, yeah, obviously not very hard at all. So, um, for the IC7300 to to uh, to get it to, to get it undone, uh, it's really simple. Icom's made it very simple to to open up the rig. It's kind of in a clamshell. There's a top clamshell and a bottom clamshell. You flip it upside down. There's ten screws, uh, just Phillips head screws, no torques that you undo, and just you pull the pull the clam the bottom clamshell out, and you're good to go. So and you can access the fan and such. So. Um, so you can see the fan itself on the, on the bottom of your screen. You can see the four screws. Uh, and then I've got uh, circled in, in yellow is uh, the fan wire, uh, which I'll show some more detailed pictures in a second. So 
Um, first thing to do is obviously just, just pull out the van, pull out the four screws and start to disassemble. Um, the, this connector, particular, this particular connector here uh, was kind of hard to find. Um, it's a very popular connector. It's a JSTPH a two millimeter, two pin connector, but to figure out what the right one, because I hadn't had much experience, uh, took me a while. So that is the actual Amazon uh, link for it. In fact, I think it's a pack of 20 for like four bucks. So if anybody wants some of these, you can just stop by my house in Midville. Uh, and I've got plenty of these. So, or, or just send me your, your, your address and I'll pop it in the mail. So uh, so it's the JST connector and you can see the fan header um, on, on, the, on the board there. So very simple there. So unplug it, pull out the fan. Uh, so the new fan is a Noctua NF8A. Um, I think this particular fan has been used a lot for PC cases in the past. It's, it's been it's award-winning and uh, very widely known for, for really, really low, uh, quiet applications. So it's the same size, same specs. Um, so you can see the, the Noctua fan, the new one on the left, and the, and the, the original ICOM 7300 fan on the right. Um, this is just from their website. It's a, it's a award-winning fan with flow acceleration channels, advanced acoustic optimization frame for superior choir, quiet cooling performance. And let me tell you, it has made a huge difference in my shack. Um, I can't even tell what I'm transmitting anymore. Um, I have to like look over at my, at my uh, rig to make sure that the little transmit lights are on or, or listen for a relay or listen for the, uh, the, the antenna tuner to, to click a relay or something. So um, it's really, really quiet now. Uh, the loudest thing in my shack now is just the relays. Um, this is real simple to do. Um, this is the, the wiring schematic. So obviously that's a piece of heat treat tube in there in the middle, but um, the, the blue and the green wires are not connected. Um, they're not connected inside there. I didn't clip them. I guess I could have clipped them, but I just left them in there in case I ever needed them. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they do. Um, but the, the black wire is the, the negative and the yellow wire is the positive. So as you can see the diagram, very simple, black to black, negative, and then red to yellow is, is the appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate um, wiring. So I soldered those together, put some heat treat tube moving on. Um, again, the hardest part was getting the, the, the right um, motherboard header, uh, uh, the JST header. So. Um, so you want to make sure you install it correctly uh, with the right airflow. You can kind of see uh, it shows the airflow at the bottom. Uh, and then there's a hole in the back of the IC7300 chassis that you'll flow those wires through. So you actually need to flow the wires back across the fan and into, into the rig. Um, so, and then you'll get the right airflow, assuming that you uh, connected the wires up correctly. So uh, I, I would assume if you reverse polarity, you would get a, a reverse airflow. Um, Tighten the fan back up. Uh, you use the old grill from 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 previous. Put it back in. I put it, put it back in. I noticed that I actually over tightened the screws too much the first time, um, and uh, I could see the the edge of the the uh, the corners bending in. So just don't over tighten your screws. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of a silicone or rubber uh, behind each of the screws that helps with the the acoustics uh, and the vibration. So. Um, and here's the final connection in. Uh, you can see over to the right. You can see where the wires come through the hole in the chassis, and they plug right into the right into the board. Really simple to get into the chassis and replace it. Actually, the hardest part of this whole project is soldering, and that's you know for all of us that's pretty simple. Um, and then you know the obvious question is, well, okay, if it's a if it's a quiet fan, is it as good of a fan? Is it gonna is it gonna overheat my rig? Um, so I did a little bit of testing uh, with the original fan. Um, and this isn't, um, you know, this is just using the power meter on the, uh, the 7300. Uh, you're doing FT8 at 100 watts, which is way too high for FT8 typically. Um, um, but at a 50% duty cycle, um, uh, the fans at uh, the temperature is at three bars. And when I put the Noctua fan in, I got four bars. So um, still very, very cool, whisper quiet, very simple, easy product uh, project. And uh, if anybody needs a couple of uh, JST connectors, just, just hit me up and I'll, I'll get them to you. So um, that's the end of my project. Um, very simple, uh, probably the simplest one you're going to see today, but uh, anyway, but it's, uh, it's, it's made a big difference in my shack. So thanks for letting me present. All right. That looks like a pretty good little addition to keeping your shack quiet and organized and, and operational. Uh, now we're going to go to Glenn Worthington, WA7X, and uh, he's got something 
interesting for us. Um, anyway, uh, a month ago today uh, was a uh, interesting day, and I know Blake is uh, sitting in uh, uh, Louisiana waiting for a hurricane to hit, and uh, uh, a month ago here in the East Valley of Salt Lake, uh, we had our hurricane force winds. So uh, I'm going to go through these slides uh, somewhat uh, quickly, but this first slide is what I woke up to on the morning of the 8th of September after winds clocked at 114 miles an hour. And as you can see, the top of my Roan 25 tower, along with tri-bander, six meter beam, uh, a, a disco antenna, and a two meter uh, Yagi uh, on top all come crashing down. And the interesting thing here is, is that I was, quite frightened is what I would discover. You can see two air conditioning units there. Uh, I have solar panels and the antenna literally came crashing down between uh, my shed, which had solar panels as well, and my home. And uh, so this was at like six in the morning and this is what I was greeted with. So a little bit of relief uh, with what I saw there, but I didn't know what the failure mode was. Uh, next slide, Clint. So uh, from the front yard, uh, I could see that my tower had broken off. Uh, it was at a joint. Uh, it was about the top 20 feet of the uh, antenna. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it was difficult at this point to ascertain completely what was wrong, but it was being held up by the mast in the center. One of the things that I do, which I've only seen a few amateurs do, is put the rotor at the base of the tower and run a mast all the way up through the tower. And it accomplishes a couple of things. One, it's easier to work on a rotor down on the ground in the dead of winter. And number two, all the torque or twist that can occur with winds uh, is transmitted down through the mast and not the tower itself. So the, the failure mode uh, wasn't so much the tower twisting as it was the, the haphazard winds that occurred that day. Next slide. So this is a view from outside and you can see it kind of uh, threaded the needle and missed things. Next slide. And we were had a, a piece of our street was being repaved and they had all of these uh, signs up and they all had summarily blown down. So at the time I took this picture, the winds were still blowing quite uh, readily. You can see one of the garbage cans up the streets down. Next slide. Uh, these are kids walking to school and they literally are pushing against the wind. Uh, the, the wind there is very intense. We took our daughter to school that day. And uh, next slide. Uh, so we started driving around the neighborhood to see what we could find. Uh, it was absolutely amazing as to what the twists and turns of the uh, winds were doing. Th this is a pole that was supplying power to uh, the uh, cable TV system and it snapped in a couple of places. Next slide. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, keep going. You can see it pretty destructive. This is part of a, a loop that I have. Uh, the tower itself was the feed point of the loop. And as the tower came down, it tensioned uh, the loop wire and, and summarily but bent uh, this point of support on my loop. And it, believe it or not, it, this, this wasn't the final place. The winds were still blowing and I was continuing to receive damage even as I took this picture. Next slide. Okay, this is with more daylight. Uh, now you can see more of the mangled mass. Next slide. Uh, and, and again, the tips of the uh, tribander were touching the solar panels, but no damage. Uh, it was very fortuitous. By the time we got home from taking my daughter to school, uh, my wife noticed that the power light on the alarm system was off. Now, most of my house is, is supplied by a UPS system, and we didn't notice immediately that the power had gone out. Well, the power went out, the diesel generator started, and it lasted for another four and a half days. And we ran extension cords to five of our neighbors to keep their freezers going. So we had power. We were as if nothing had happened other than the, the purr of the generator. Next slide. Okay, keep going. Uh, and a little more close ups of and, and looking at the angles. This is a, a neighbor across the street uh, whose a car was parked next to a tree. 
and uh, the tree simply lifted her car up about eight feet in the air. She had to get a couple of tow trucks to uh, lift it out. Next slide. Okay, another view. Next slide. Okay, another one. Okay, so you can see that bent more than the earlier picture. So it was continuing. You can see the slack on the line now. Go ahead, next slide. And there's the side view, a little more dramatic. Uh, I had a uh, uh, Ethernet link uh, that was on the uh, tower and redeployed it on the mount on the chimney so I could get that reestablished. Next slide. Uh, this is a piece of uh, a steel that I have put into place. It's about 18 feet long that was going to be used for a guy wire. I have a, uh, uh, a gully behind my house that goes down quite a few feet and I needed to have a third guy point and we'll see that a little bit later here. Go ahead, next slide. And all this time, this is 2020. This is looking from my backyard up towards Mount Olympus. Those flames have to be 200 feet high and that was the Neff's Canyon fire. So it's, it's exciting. Okay, so starting to rebuild uh, the antenna system, I started with the loop. And uh, part of what I did is I trimmed trees and uh, put up more permanent like rather than shooting lines over the uh, trees. We we're using the man lift. Now uh, it was worth renting for an entire week for safe reasons. Uh, and so this is one of my contractors who's uh, tying up uh, a point for the, uh, an insulator on my, my loop to go back up. Next slide. And there you can see he's into the trees extended out. It's a 60 foot man lift. Next slide. And here is the new feed point that I'm establishing for the loop. I'm taking a decision here now. I almost didn't put the tower up, but with the encouragement of Clint, KA7OEI, and my neighbors remarkably, uh, because I guess they're grateful for the power. Uh, they said, when are you gonna get that antenna back up? They've decided that amateur radio is probably a good thing. Next slide. And here we are starting to dissemble. There's no way that a gin pole was possible to use uh, to disassemble this safely. So using the man lift, we kind of took the antennas starting at the top off. Next slide. And we continue to take pieces, parts off. There's the remaining six meter antenna. Next slide. And here we've cleared off all the antennas and, and we're getting ready. And if you look at that closely, you can begin to see there, the tower literally sheared off. And the only thing holding it was the center mast, which is a, a inch and a half uh, uh, rigid conduit uh, that goes from the bottom to the top. Uh, next slide. And you can see that it literally tore the uh, Rhone 25 apart. And we pulled the feed lines back up through. And now we're about at a point, go ahead, next slide, uh, where we're gonna start cutting down uh, the, the top of the tower and uh, we, we cut it down and we had to keep it kind of in those two pieces. Next slide. And here we, we get it down to the ground and uh, the top section was still viable, but those two intermediate sections were uh, ruined. Uh, continue on. And there we got off uh, the, uh, the slide. Now in preparation to re replace this tower, uh, next slide again, uh, Clint, uh, that is a, a guy uh, connection for Roan Tower. And uh, I've decided to guy it, even though it was rated above the house brackets to, to withstand 105 mile an hour wind, uh, critically 114 mile an hour wind, it didn't survive. And so to change that, uh, Roan 25G, the G stands for guide. Uh, I, I've uh, lightened the wind load almost uh, in half move things uh, out of the way and put on guy wires. Uh, go next slide. So uh, that is one of my corners. It's a flagpole in the front of my yard and you can see the loop is back up uh, with that corner insulator. Next slide. And uh, here, here we're trying to get the uh, a midpoint on the other side of the loop, which goes on to the uh, chimney. Next slide. And here is the new feed point. Uh, the interesting thing about this feed point is, is, is that uh, I bring it down with a ladder line, uh, go through a, uh, a ballon, and uh, it goes through the wall, and my ham shack is literally behind that. Now, I do have a DC ground that goes from that point 
on down. But as Clint points out, I don't have a true ground uh, like I did before where I bought, brought it down all the way. But the good news is, is the loop is lower than the remainder of the tower. And the hope is, is the loop would never get hit with lightning. Lightning, that's another story. So in deciding what antennas to put back up, um, I, my two meter uh, cross polarized uh, Yagi was destroyed, but I happen to have a log periodic that's rated from about 45 megahertz to 1300 megahertz. Uh, it was missing this, uh, this coil on the back of it, which is used to, to primarily provide DC ground uh, along the conductors, the feed points at the front of this antenna. But this is something I constructed. Here is the uh, feed for the loop, which is now at a, a new point. You can see the ballon. You can see the ground wire connected. Uh, and it goes right into a ground rod. Next slide. And here is the new ballon for the new tri-bander. I decided to purchase a new uh, A4S uh, tri-band antenna. And by the way, insurance didn't cover anything because there was no damage to my house. Had there been some damage to my house, I may have gotten some coverage. But in this instance, it's a very expensive uh, thing. And so <clears throat> this is the uh, transformer uh, that I'm using at the feed point of the tri-bander. Next slide. Here I have some diligent helpers. Uh, the one in the blue is Clint, KA7OEI. The other one's Dan and 7 qxb and uh, put, put out the pieces, parts of this brand new A4S uh, to start assembly. Next slide. And here they are debating which piece goes where and naming the different pieces and uh, uh, measuring correctly. You can see in the background there, my neighbor's uh, antenna, tri-bander across the street. His tower was guide, and, and during the windstorm, he looked up at it, and he noticed no movement other than the tribander itself was kind of flopping in the wind. Because I had a 40-meter add-on kit for the antenna that came crashing down, and I purchased a new one, I gave him the 40-meter uh, kit that matched that antenna. Next slide. Okay, so here we are. We have the tower back up. Uh, it's, it's back up to its height, and we're beginning to put the mast in. Next slide. And here, <clears throat> you know, Clint and Dan are out with the uh, newly assembled uh, antenna and beginning to test it with an antenna analyzer. And it was quite interesting as they started testing it, it was flaky as all get out. What this picture is showing <clears throat> is there is a, a metal screw that is supposed to capture that outer aluminum and tie it to the inner aluminum. But if you notice, the threads end before the top of the screw. There was no mechanical connection right there. So we put in some stainless steel nuts as spacers and uh, that was Clint's idea. <clears throat> and that allowed us to cap the, the uh, uh, traps. Okay, next slide. And here you can see another view of, of how that was connected. Now, the next thing is we discovered the taps didn't seem to work consistently. This is what the tap, trap color cover removed <clears throat> and we discovered that the same trap the the tc 13 or whatever it was had anywhere from two to four insulators in uh the trap it turned out that three was probably the ideal uh number and so we redistributed the wealth of the uh, uh insulators uh, to make the traps all equal and and then with the proper screw in there that got those traps going. It, it turned out that th this is the trap for 20 meters, which is used for the 40 meter element. And we thought that they were uh, put together with screws that were of the correct type. They in fact were. However, <clears throat> the second trap we took apart, as you can see, there is a, a enameled wire with no enamel taken off of it. All other three connections on the two traps had uh, been tinned and properly uh, connected. This one end was not connected. So now we're discovering lots of bits and pieces of this antenna that were uh, not very well constructed. So here's the first antenna to go up. Uh, this is the log periodic that uh, covers from uh, 45 to 1300 megahertz. Um, you can see the beginning of the guy wires and the guys are made of Philly strand, which is the Kevlar-like material rated at 1,200 pounds uh, each. And you can see that I put it above the last joint 
realizing that the joint seemed to be the weak link. This isn't gonna happen again to me. Next one. Okay, so you can see the mast installed, uh, the feed lines are running. Uh, these are the guy wires being attached into the structure of the home. Uh, those are lag bolted into the, uh, the, the uh, roof structure and uh, tied in quite uh, nicely. Now you can see them uh, a bit tighter. And now uh, we got the tri-bander up and uh, it, it was ready to go and working. So at this point, Clint uh, went up as well. He's the, uh, the master of tuning in high places. Next slide. And this is the support for the third guy, which like I said, it goes down into a goalie and that piece of pipe that I showed earlier. And this is tied into railroad ties. Those ties uh, supported, uh, that is a, a five inch pipe. There was an eight inch pipe that supported an eight foot dish for about 25 years and it did not move. Had it moved, it would have gone off point. And there you can see the uh, turnbuckle and the connection to the third guy. Next slide. And there's the third guy going up to the tower. It's quite a bit longer than the other guys, uh, but it's, it's tight and the uh, uh, turnbuckle made it work very well. Uh, okay, that's it for the slides, I think. Uh, I'd like to, to thank also uh, Tom, uh, WA7ZRG, who is on this call, also came up uh, to help. And unfortunately, he found out that the, um, the, the connectors uh, on the, uh, the, the Aggie uh, were razor blade sharp and he cut his finger and had six stitches uh, put in his finger. So we had a casualty in this and Tom can show his finger here in a little bit uh, about how that, uh, that happened. So uh, felt very bad about that. Um, he, he claims there's no pain or very minimal pain. So he, he might make a comment or two about that process. So I call this the, the re-erection of the, the tower that went down, uh, a very expensive uh, homebrew project. Uh, but you know what, uh, this is a hobby that uh, is worth investing in. So the only other thing I, I built, Clint can see this, is the uh, new NFED wireless uh, uh, 49 to one ballon uh, with three cores on it. That'll be going down to the cabin to the other remote site. And uh, that's another project for another day. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Hey, well, thanks. Hey, Glenn, I, I, got a, I got a question, if you don't Certainly. mind. Um, uh, two, two questions. How many tower sections did you have to replace? And I guess you had a lot of confidence on the ones that weren't damaged. And the other question is, how in the heck did you get a 40-foot piece of pipe through that tower? Did you go... <laughs> How, how do you, how do you install the you know that mast or the the you know the pipe in the middle of the tower? The, those, those are two great questions. Okay, first of all, the, uh, the only two sections of the tower that were destroyed, if you will, were the uh, second from the top and the third from the top, and so about four feet above the house there was still completely viable and intact, and uh, so two sections had to be replaced. Uh, and I happened to have those sections uh, sitting in storage, so I had no problem. But the other ones are, are toast uh, one way or the other. So, no, just up a little higher, Clint. Uh, you can see the junction. Just a, you, were, you were in the right area uh, with the arrow there. Uh, that, the, everything above that section, there were two sections. I, I was pointing out the two house brackets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of house brackets there. Okay, and then putting the pipe down. Well, the only way you can do that is feed them down from the top, Ron. So you can either do that when the tower is completely constructed and put them through the thrust bearing and drop them all the way down to the bottom or as you're constructing the tower, <coughs> you, can, you can place them in. I have uh, uh, grade eight bolts uh, that go through the, the uh, uh, couplers that captivate the rotation so that the rotation of the uh, rotor uh, goes completely through there. Uh, so those are two great questions, Ron. Yeah, do you have any other bearings kind of halfway up the tower? Or is it just labeled or just, it's just stiff enough that it doesn't? Yeah, uh, there are bushings there. Okay, uh, yeah, if if bushings. you saw those, they're made of treks, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, which is yeah. kind of slick. Yeah, it's just, uh, just a bushing. It, yeah. Just holds it there. I think Clint was sh showing there were a couple of them there. There's a thrust bearing on top. Yeah. It's can it's holding all the weight of everything. Yeah. 
the rotor on the bottom, which is uh, a tail twister 2D or T, TX or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not holding any load on that. But uh, yeah, if you don't put those intermediate uh, bushings in there during the heat and cold, uh, the uh, uh, see, you can see a couple of them there. I think I have three total. They, yeah, that last slide has them. And you yeah, can see those little bushings. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Yep. Good questions. Good presentation. I appreciate that. Yeah, for those that don't know, Glenn lives at the mouth of, of uh, Mill Creek Canyon. And when we get those canyon winds, the canyons funnel the, the wind through the canyon and it enhances the speed and of the wind and also tends to churn it. I actually live uh, about a mile west of him and it did a number on my backyard. You know, a couple, uh, one other interesting thing about the, the winds, I had a weather station located on the top mm -hmm. of that tower. I had removed it two days before the windstorm at the advice of Dan N7QXB, who's a weather expert, because my temperatures weren't reading correctly. Uh, obviously, they would have read a, a, a great wind force, but it saved uh, that. And then also that night, upon hearing that this wind was going to go there, I turned the antenna to face southerly. And that probably also saved me from, from damage. So good point. Yeah. Kind of got to pay attention to what's going on because it can come back to bite you. All right. Now we're going to go over to Tom Kamlowski and he's got uh, the restoration of a linear amplifier to show us. So go ahead. Take it away, Tom. Okay, are you able to hear me all right? Good. Yeah, it was uh, quite a, an experience uh, visiting with Glenn and, and helping the Glenn and, and his crew uh, work on those antennas a bit. It was a lot of fun. If you get an opportunity sometime, uh, you should go take a look at it. Glenn has quite an impressive antenna setup. And I did have that injury that uh, Glenn had talked about that uh, uh, resulted in me heading over to Instacare and having a few sutures thrown in. That's a story in itself. Uh, the good news part of that was is that there wasn't a single person there <laughs> other than the staff. And uh, so I gave them something to do. And after they had finished suturing, they, uh, I asked the doctor, I said, well, you know, I, if, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take the stitches out myself when it's, when it's time. And uh, he looked at me kind of funny and said, here's a suture removal kit. <laughs> <laughs> he actually quizzed me a little bit first just to make sure and, and gave me some pointers on things. But today was the day I actually took the uh, sutures out. So you can't see anything here, but I've got a ba uh, uh, Band-Aid on it at the moment. So I think we're going to heal up nicely. Okay, so um, hopefully you're able to see the uh, uh, chart okay. This is my first slide. I'm going to talk today about restoration of a of an old Heathkit SB1000 linear amplifier. And I don't know if the cursor is uh, showing up on there. I hope so, because I wanted to use that as kind of a pointer. And uh, maybe somebody, Clint, or somebody could give me a nod if you're able to see the cursor on my screen. So that I'll use as a pointer. Then. Perfect, all right. So yeah, my name is Tom Kamlowski, I'm WA7ZRG. This is actually my first linear amplifier. I've uh, done a lot of hamming, but I've never had a linear amplifier before. This is a fun project and I'm gonna take you through it, uh, how, this, uh, how this came about. So uh, this linear amplifier, uh, the SB1000 is a kit amplifier that was sold by Heathkit in the, in the mid 1980s. Uh, for a retail price of approximately $700, and it was discontinued by Heathkit. Heathkit actually was discontinued a little later, but uh, back in the 90s uh, is when this they stopped producing this kit. And the basic specification for the Heathkit SB1000 amplifier is that it, it covers uh, the, the bands that are shown there, the 160, the 80, the 40, 20, and 15 meter amateur bands, but it also uh, covers the uh, 
uh, the military amateur radio service and the war expands. So you can uh, tune it there if, if uh, you're, you're using it in those areas. Uh, it has an input drive of a, a maximum input drive of 100 watts, and you, you really won't ever need to go to that to get the maximum power out of the amplifier. Uh, the, 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 the rated output power uh, maximum is uh, on sideband is 1,000 watts peak envelope power, and CW is 850 watts. Uh, the amplification gain is uh, approximately 12 dB or better, and it uses one iMac 3-500Z uh, power triode. Uh, the third order distortion on this amplifier is uh, minus 30, 30 dB or better. And the uh, size, weight, and power, the swap is uh, eight and a quarter inches high, 14 and a half wide, 15 and a half deep. And it is a rather heavy amplifier. It weighs 48 pounds. It's got a lot of iron in it. And you'll be seeing some pictures here in just a minute. It can be configured to operate on either 120 volts AC at 15 amps or 240 volts at seven and a half amps. So this was the amplifier when it showed up in my garage. Uh, it was the, the SB1000 amplifier was uh, from, from the estate of a silent key and it was purchased in as is condition. We, I didn't have any idea what, what it was gonna be like. It looked okay from the outside, but uh, the surprises come later. And so I set it on a, uh, on a rolling uh, work case here and just took a couple of pictures of it sitting out in the garage before I got started. And then I set it on a workbench and uh, now begins the tedious process. And this is probably the most important part. Before you do anything, you've really got to make a very careful assessment, to a visual inspection of what you're really dealing with here. Take the cover off, just start looking around. And so I, I, I did that. And if you look kind of closely here, that this is the 3500Z iMac tube, and it is just covered in dust. And this whole amplifier was quite dirty inside. What that tells me is it probably had been used because there's a fan sitting behind that tube and it actually puts air into the tank circuit here. And so it probably drafted uh, just dust from the environment it was in and uh, collected on the tube. So that's what it looked like once I got the cover off of it. So now I've got to figure out where, where to start. <laughs> what, what do you do? <laughs> here's this amplifier. And oh, by the way, here's a schematic diagram of the amplifier. So uh, uh, what, how do I figure out what to do about this amplifier? And I really like this next slide. Um, <laughs> This is an old uh, ham radio magazine article. Uh, this is the front cover of a ham radio magazine. And that's a little bit of the feeling that you, that you might have when you tear into a piece of equipment. You'll look at it for the first time. You've got the cover off. Uh, you were fortunate enough to find the schematic, but, but now you've got to try to locate everything else and figure out what on earth am I, what, what, what is it, why am I here? <laughs> So uh, that, there was a little bit of trepidation at the beginning, and so I, I figured I'd better put this slide in just to, just to kind of give you a sense for it. Okay, so when I went through and did this inspection on the amplifier, I, I didn't hook up anything to the amplifier. I didn't hook up power, I didn't hook up a radio, an antenna, didn't hook anything to the amplifier whatsoever. I just went through and did a visual inspection very, very methodically, just went over every single scrap of the amplifier, just touching everything, looking inside, trying to understand it. And listed here, I'm not gonna read this list, we're gonna go through some of this stuff anyway. Uh, these are the things that just showed up as, a, as, a, as part of a visual inspection, not, not part of any testing, but just, just things that I noticed and started writing down uh, before I got started. And the first one, this one was a little bit surprising. Um, was that the amplifier over here on this photo on the left actually arrived to me with this, this is a 120 volt NEMA 5 uh, outlet plug, like what you'd use on any you know, three prong plug in your home. This is what the amplifier had on it. But as I looked at this wiring on the wiring block here, this terminal block the schematic, what I discovered was that the amplifier was actually wired operate on 240 volts. So I've got a little bit of a, a little bit of a disconnect here, a little bit of a consistency. I've got a 120 volt plug and I've got an amplifier that's that's strapped to operate on 240 volts. And 
I, I, after looking at the amplifier a little bit more, I, I was able to determine that if somebody had plugged that into a 120 volt circuit, the amplifier would not even have tried to come on because it actually checks the voltage and makes sure that it's the right voltage uh, before it'll close the, uh, the starter relay. And so there wouldn't be any hassle or hazard of plugging it into 120. Uh, but, but it kind of begs the question, if, if it was being used this way, that, that would seem to indicate that whoever was using this would have had a regular 120 volt outlet in their home that was actually wired to operate on 240 volts. And so in a situation like that, of course, you'd have to hope that, you know, someone doesn't show up with like the vacuum cleaner or some other appliance in your home and try plugging it into this outlet that is also being used uh, from time to time uh, with the linear amplifier because you'd have some real, uh, some real fireworks if that were to happen. And so that had to go and it was kind of crummy looking anyway. So I bought a new, over this photo on the right, I bought a new NEMA 6. This is actually a 240 volt rated outlet or plug. And I took this old one off and I installed that onto the cord. And so there, there, there's the first thing on the list, I've knocked that off now. I've got a real plug on there that hopefully will be compatible for 240 volts. Uh, so moving on, the next thing I discovered was you know, and I, it, the thing that I could kick myself is this was in there for about almost a week. I'd had the cover off. I'd been looking at this thing. And then I was looking at some YouTubes of guys running these linear amplifiers. Some of them had the covers off. And it finally dawned on me that there was something inside my amplifier that nobody else had. And I couldn't understand what was going on. So I went back in there and looked again. And what it was, was someone had added this, this thing here, to this amplifier, which consisted of a phenolic board with two huge, you know, like 30 watt resistors that were wired in series with the 700 volt secondary of the transformer. One of the resistors was burned open and it had been bypassed. If you take a look here, this is 700 volts on this piece of wire that's going across that somebody had put across this one resistor. And I don't know why it was there. I really don't. I, I'm wondering if maybe he was trying to lower the output voltage of the transformer a little bit to lower the power. It's hard to know. But only one of the resistors was working and the other one had been bypassed with this piece of wire. This addition is not part of the original Heathkit design or its construction, so I, I tore it out. <laughs> that had to go. So I, I ripped that out, disconnected it, and used the schematic diagram to figure out you know, the wires that he had put into this uh, homebrew part of the board and uh, wired it back into the high voltage regulator uh, with this piece removed. So that, that was kind of an inclusion that was uh, a bit of a surprise. Uh, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing I discovered was where this yellow arrow is pointing down here is the meter switch. And that meter switch is used to uh, monitor different functions within the amplifier. You can monitor the high voltage voltage, the voltage on the high voltage, the B plus. You can measure the output power. You can measure um, uh, ALC voltage, and I guess that's pretty much it. There's four, there's actually four positions on, I've got a setting right here. There's actually four positions. Well, the switch had actually separated. It's kind of hard to see in this photo, but that red piece and that gray piece are supposed to be pushed together. And the switch just kind of went around and around inside of the rotary switch. So it wasn't really working right. So I, I took that board off and worked on the switch, and I was actually able to restore the switch, get it back together again, and get it to function properly. So that uh, it would not have worked the way it was, but it, I was able to rebuild the switch and, and get it to function correctly. The next thing that I noticed, and I haven't done as good of a job on this, uh, these are the this is the band switch, which changes the tank circuit. Uh, so that it can operate on different bands. And if you look closely here, you'll notice there's a lot of really dark sections. And what that is, is that's oxidation. Most of the, these old, um, the wafers on these old high voltage uh, rotary switches uh, were silver plate and they'll oxidize really bad. And so usually what you wanna try to do is find a product or a, an ink eraser or something to try to scrape off that 
uh, that oxidation if you possibly can. So I spent a little bit of time trying to clean up all of that oxidation so that I had better electrical connections into the uh, uh, band switch. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise. What you're looking at here is this is an RF choke that is on the output of the uh, the amplifier just before it goes to the antenna relay. And the, the, the idea behind it, you'll notice that it's kind of, it's been hit and damaged and worse than that, right down where this arrow is pointing, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but the wire was actually torn away from the, uh, from the inductor and the inductor was open circuit. And you want to have that inductor on your amplifier because what it does is it makes sure that you don't have any high voltage DC on the output of the amplifier. It's okay to have an RF voltage, it's what it's for, uh, but it's you shouldn't have any DC voltage leaking out onto the output. And so if there is some, some stray voltage that's uh, on the output, this inductor will act like an, uh, a short circuit for that DC voltage and send it to ground. It, it, and keeps a high voltage from uh, acting as a hazard. So I, so there's, so my first attempt was to replace this. I bought another inductor, uh, but it failed, and I wasn't able to make it work. So I actually went in. I don't have a picture of it, but I was actually able to go back in and I added a piece of wire onto this inductor, and I was able to restore this inductor to get it to work. And then this is actually the TR relay. Uh, the TR contact, the, the contact points on the TR relay are oxidized and carbonized, and, and some of them look like they might even have been melted. But I got in and inspected it closer; they were okay, and I was able to use some uh, some emery cloth to clean the contacts on the uh, on the relay. And you'll notice here, like this one contact is done all the way out. I straightened that. And the design uh, on these older amplifiers, they didn't worry too much about the coil uh, having any uh, effects on the, the exciter, the radio that you're using this with. On modern radios that have a lot of um, semiconductor type switching, you usually don't wanna be switching a coil with a, with a semiconductor because you can get a, a voltage surge down that could damage the semiconductor. So the, the normal way of trying to protect against that is to put what's called a flyback diode across the coil. And that inductive surge, when you, when you try to de-energize the coil, that inductive surge then will be, be sent back into the coil and it'll have a, a tendency to, to squelch itself out so you don't wind up with a really high voltage damaging the semiconductor switch. So I added a diode across the coil. And then this is, uh, there's eight of these uh, big capacitors. This is just two of them. There's, uh, there's um, is there eight of them? No, there's, how many are there? There's C401 through 407, okay. Well, anyway, all of these capacitors are of the electrolytic type and they're, they're probably gonna need to be replaced at some point in this 35 year old amplifier. I haven't done that yet. I was able to, well, you'll see in a minute, but, uh, didn't want to replace these capacitors just yet. So I, I left the capacitors in place. So these are a few photos taken after I had cleaned the amplifier out inside. You'll notice I haven't taken off this phenolic. So this, this picture is a little bit old, although that, that's not there now, but, but the rest of the amplifier is all together. So um, it's just about ready now. I've, everything that I could find, I've, I've made those repairs to the amplifier. And so after the requisite pairs are made, it's time to power it on for the very first time. And I'll tell you, that's quite an experience because, you know, you've got a large amplifier that's running on 240 volts and you're going to come over here and you're going to push this uh, power on switch right here. So I'm like, maybe I need a, like a, a big long stick or something that I should push this with because I don't know what's going to happen. It's never been powered up before. I had my wife standing back behind me, you know, with her, her finger on 911 just in case. And I did, I literally, I did have some <laughs> fire extinguishers close by because I didn't know. <laughs> you never know. Those big capacitors can be a, a real surprise. So we powered it on. And voila, it, it actually came up. If you look over here on the, uh, uh, it was come up, not blow up, it, it, it actually turned on. And if you look here to the left, you'll see this, um, that, that is the 3500Z, the filament lighting up. It lights up like a light bulb inside. 
And if you look, if you can see closely here, this uh, function switch is set to the high voltage section, so it's reading high voltage. And right now, that meter is pointing to about 3,400 volts. So the B plus voltage on that tube is 3,400. And so we're sitting there at 3,400 volts. Everything's looking good. So we passed the power on test. Now it's time to see if the amplifier works. So, and we want it to work on all five bands. So this is the setup that I use. This is pretty simple. Uh, we have the, the transceiver, which for me is a 7300. This is a piece of RG58. This is the device under test, this yellow thing. That's the Heathkit amplifier. This is a piece of LMR240. And this goes into my RF power meter. Then this is a piece of RG8, the big three quarter inch stuff. And then into a uh, well filled dummy load. So that's the test setup that I was gonna use to see if I can get this thing to actually work on each of the bands. So I fired up and voila, it's working on the 160 and 80 meter bands. You'll notice that the end switch is set to 160 in the photo on the left. And I've got the uh, meter switch set to power output. We're at about approximately 500 watts right there. And in the case of the 80-meter uh, band, a little bit higher, maybe closer to 600 watts. Here we are on the 40-meter band, the 20-meter band, and the 15-meter band. And I'm running pretty close to over 500 watts in each case. Um, so, and I'll go through these quickly because I know you don't want to spend a lot of time. I, I actually went through and very systematically characterized each of the bands, starting with 7% uh, exciter, working it all the way up to about 40 watts of input power. And th these are my meter readings, how, how it had about 460 watts on the, uh, the power meter. The meter on the amplifier was reading a little bit high. I, I needed to know that so that I could go back later and calibrate the meter on the amplifier. And in this case, I was getting, this is actually the lowest gain in the 160 meter band. It's only got about 11 dB gain. And on the 80 meter band, we were getting about 13 dB gain, same thing. And I had it up to about 550 watts. And on the 40 meter band, a little over 12 dB gain. 560 watts, 675 according to the uh, meter on the uh, amplifier, but it was reading plus. So I, that's, that's, it wasn't really that high. Uh, so I've gone back and recalibrated that. And then on 20 meter band, uh, around 11 watts. On 15 meter band, 455 watts. So those are the, uh, those are the uh, performance numbers for each of the bands that I tested it on. It's working on all the bands. So my final thoughts on this project are, you know, what, what helped me make this project successful was choosing to restore a kit amplifier, a kit amplifier that was designed and documented for assembly and calibration by almost any amateur radio operator using simple tools and simple knowledge. You know, this would have been much more difficult to just jump into a, an amplifier that was not a kit built because you're probably not going to have as good of documentation as what I was able to come across. So the, the heat kits like this one, they're very well documented. And finding the instructions and the schematics and the operating guides is not difficult at all. There's also a large user group and plenty of YouTube videos with good information on these kits. And so, you know, if you just take your time and work your way through it and you're careful, you know, with a linear amplifier, you need to be careful because there are some, uh, there are some potential hazards inside the amplifier. Uh, but if you just take your time and work through it systematically, you can get there. This was a fun project for me, and I would recommend uh, that other amateur radio operators consider restoring a kit as an alternative to purchasing something new. Uh, you know, I had time, I was home, things being the way they are here in 2020, uh, it was a great distraction for me. And I think that's my last slide. So that's that's pretty much it. So let's see if I can uh, stop sharing. And that should do it. Any other questions or? So I take it, Tom, you ran a 220 volt circuit to your shack that wasn't there before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. You know, actually, I had 240 volts out in the garage. That's where I actually did the restoration and got did my first testing. On one of the slides, I should have pointed it out. When I was turning the power on, I actually had the amplifier 
sitting on a welding table because I, I didn't know, you know what I, what might happen. So I figured the best thing to do was to set it on a welding table. Uh, so once we got the 240 volt uh, there in the in the uh, in the garage working, uh, you know, one thing leads to another, and I actually hired some electricians to come out and put a 240 volt circuit in the ham shack here. And while you're at it, why don't we just throw in a whole new breaker panel and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, th that was really the expense for me was uh, doing the uh, remodel on the electrical for the house. And uh, I really do like my new uh, NEMA 6 outlet in the ham shack, though. It's pretty cool. I should have included that in the, in the slide stack. Yeah, I've heard your amp on the air and it sounds just fine and yep. makes you a lot louder, too. <laughs> Thank you, Clint. Yeah, and are, are you still running like uh, RG58 with that thousand watt amplifier? <laughs> well, I, I never, <laughs> thank you, Ron. I, I never really did run RG58 on the output of the amplifier. I, I ran what I thought was RG8X, but as I dug into it a little bit more, it was actually LMR240, which has a much heavier uh, uh, foil type braid. And I wouldn't recommend running even LMR240 on that. You know, Ron knows this. And uh, the only reason that I was able to get away with that was that uh, part of the reason is that uh, my SWR was very, very low, about 1.2 to 1. And so I didn't have a, an opportunity for some really high standing waves on the transmission line uh, to, to, to cause some sort of a, an effect, a short type circuit. So I wouldn't recommend running a large amplifier on, on something quite that small. You'd be I, better I, off with LMR 400. I, I will admit, I will confess that I run my 1500 watts through mini age. It just gets somewhat warm is all. Well, but, and I think if you've got, if you stay on top of your SWR, yeah. you're going to be just fine. Yeah, probably. Right. Do you all have right. the Ron Jones K7RJ? Uh, his thing set up. I have up. everything queued up, and we we have one better. We actually have a Ron here as well. Well, hey everybody, uh, I'm Ron K7RJ. Uh, I've been in UARC forever. A lot of you know me, and a lot of you don't, because a bunch of years ago, uh, four or five years ago, Elaine and I, Elaine in Seven BDZ, she's the former president of UARC. Uh, uh, we moved to uh, Tucson, and we've been living in Tucson for the last uh, last few years. But I'm still connected with the with UARC, uh, help with some little projects here and there, and try to stay in touch with a lot of the guys. Uh, you know, get on the air, yak with them, and so forth. Uh, so I'm one of the guys. <laughs> Uh, I just finished a little project that uh, just the timing was good. It, uh, you're doing the homebrew meeting, which I always like, and I thought, well, gee, I'll, I'll kind of share this with you. You might, you might get a, get kind of a kick out of it. So here we go. Those of you that know me know that I'm quite a homebrewer. I love building little circuits and tinkering around with uh, the latest little thing that comes along. A bunch of years ago, I bought a, uh, a well, these cheap clocks. They run on a battery, and the secondhand advances. You know, one click at a time, one second at a time, <laughs> and there's an oscillator in there that generates a obviously a one second pulse and just advances the second hand. That's all they do. The rest of it's mechanical. You have to manually set the clock, plug the battery in, and the second hand starts ticking away. And the gears inside do all the appropriateness. Um, well, I've got two of these clocks up there. Oh, how do I point my fingers? Uh, everything's backwards on the com on the camera. <laughs> Uh, one is set on the UTC, Zulu time, and the other is set on local time. And uh, the trouble with these clocks is they're never synchronized, they're always off a little, they're never quite on time. And I thought it'd be great to have some kind of a GPS, uh, something that generated a very accurate one second pulse, carve into the electronics on those things and make my little very accurate one second pulse move the, and keep those things running. So that's a little project I did. Let me kind of real quickly go over real quickly uh, what I did. Uh, <laughs> take a lot more than two or four minutes to show everything I did. But uh, anyway, we'll just give you kind of a rundown. Okay, to get started, I uh, built the electronics around uh, an Arduino. An Arduino is a little microprocessor. 
But what's important about it that makes it different than just like a PIC microprocessor is it's got a lot of the electronics, a lot of the circuitry built on it. So you don't have to muck around with drivers and oscillators and power supply regulators. You just get an Arduino, plug it in, and uh, write a little bit of a computer program. But the computer programs, if you're doing a little simple stuff, are really simple programs. And that's kind of part of the fun is figuring out how to do that. And then uh, you don't have to really do too much wiring. In fact, a lot of the stuff you'd want to connect it to, is kind of already built for you in the form of what they call shields. And here's a shield that has uh, got the relays. So if you have a little project and you want to operate some relays, switch an antenna, turn a rotor, or turn on some lights, you can write the program, plug this shield in here, and all you got to do is connect your wires to whatever the heck you wanted to do. And uh, you can have inputs, outputs, and they make a, a gob of these shields. Or you can also just make your own little circuit. So these are very, very handy, pretty quick to make some really cool projects. So I don't want to get into the details about Arduinos. That's just a very, very quick summary. Once you write the program, you can just plug it in and make it use work. I chose not to quite do it that way. I used the basic Arduino development stuff, and then I downloaded the program that goes into the Arduino instead of into the Arduino into a single little chip. And so my entire program is on this. So everything runs on this and not that big clunky, uh, clunky uh, the Arduino board. And then to get the program into this chip, it's just a little microprocessor, uh, you get one of these little guys <laughs> uh, for 10 bucks. And you can, you know, it's used for, you, you, you keep using it. And uh, you plug in your microprocessor you want to program into here, push a couple of buttons, and bingo. Now the code is on here that used to be on here. There's another thing, and so uh, that was it. So uh, another thing that I purchased for $8 was this guy. This is a complete GPS receiver. Eight bucks. Uh, it's got, it's got a lot of pins, but the pins, most of the pins you don't even use. You need power and ground, same voltage that runs the Arduino, you don't have anything special. This one runs on 5 volts. Um, and uh, one of the outputs is a one second pulse. It's time to GPS, right exactly at the beginning of every second there's a pulse. Ding. And it's time, you know, it's GPS time, so it's right on. Uh, and then there's a couple of more pins that uh, have data coming out of the GPS. It tells you your uh, position and how many satellites and all of that kind of GPS stuff. I don't need any of that. All I needed was, and the time, it could tell you the time, but me knowing the time doesn't help any because I can't actually mechanically set that clock with, the, with the electronics. So I don't even care what time it is. All I do want to know is where the one second pulse is. And the rest of the outputs I just ignore. So, uh, so that was it. Uh, before I show you the actual thingy that I built, I'll drag out a clock and show you how they work. So that, that may help. So give me one second here. Through the magic of video editing, I will be instantly back. Okay, uh, instantly back. Uh, I bought a, uh, just to figure out how these clocks work, I bought a uh, cheapo uh, clock on eBay for a couple of dollars. And you know, the same, the same clock that's uh, hanging on the wall. And I just wanted to see how it works. So I tore it apart to see what in the heck is going on inside. And here's what I found. A whole lot of gears. <laughs> but that's okay. But the important thing is right here. This is the electronics that makes it work. It's uh, really cool. Now this circuit board has a, a little oscillator, a chip, and this big thing here is a capacitor. So that doesn't matter. What's important is a coil and this little armature magnet uh, here. And the way this thing works is really kind of cool. Uh, there's a coil and there's the uh, core for the coil. And then uh, the, uh, maybe go and put that in there. Whenever there's current goes through, through the coil, you get a little magnetic field here at these pole pieces, the north pole, south pole. And this little guy is a little uh, magnet. It's a, a little round magnet with a hole in the middle and a gear on one end. And so this rotates around. Uh, and so it's just a magnet. Just to pick up nails and tooth and uh, 
you know, things, bobby pins and stuff. Uh, North Pole, South Pole, except this is a unique kind of magnet. It's called a transverse magnet, and that is the magnetic, the North Pole and South Pole, are not on the ends, but on the side. They're on each side of that little hole that's in the middle. And when this sucker sits in here, uh, for all the, you know, in the appropriate way, uh, it, it sits right in here. It rests in this, in the metal here. And when you get a magnetic field, it opposes the magnet, or it can oppose the magnetic field that's on the magnet, and it'll flip around. Now, there's a little bit of things in there, the way they arrange it, and the way the pole pieces are, are shaped, it dictates that it will always go in the same direction instead of just back and forth, but that's a, a detail. These are called Levitt motors, and they're fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I think the thing I got most out of this whole project was learning about these little motors. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll not, I'll not go into any, any more about the motor, other than to say that all you have to do with these things is put a voltage, uh, all I had to do was put a voltage on these two pins. These pins go to the coil, it's just the wrapping of the coil. And in order to get, a make, get the, the polarity in one phase, you put plus on one and minus on the other, or ground on one and plus on the other, but you put, and then to flip the fed, flip the polarity around, you just turn it around. You ground the one pin and raise the other one high. And for a microprocessor, that's a piece of cake. And uh, for this low voltage, only needs a couple of volts and very low current. The microprocessor, my little chip here, can easily easily uh, provide that that much current and uh, and and uh, different uh, polarity that it needed. So I wrote a little program that would look at the one second pulse from the uh, GPS and then generate either a, a polarity voltage on the, uh, on the uh, magnet this way and then this way on the next pulse and then this way and this way. A couple little minor details in there to make it work right. I had to have some current limiting and uh, the length of the pulse was somewhat critical but that, that doesn't matter. So anyway, uh, okay. Next, I'll show you the little circuit that I made, and then we'll do a little demo of the uh, of the clock itself to see if it works. See if it still works. <laughs> okay, uh, a little different camera and different microphone, so we'll sound different. Uh, this is what I ended up with. There's two bike, two of the little microprocessors. I just put one microprocessor uh, on each clock. It was easier than trying to have one microprocessor drive them both. These things cost you know, like two dollars. So. Uh, the case is the back and uh, the front panel are 3D printed, and they're just screwed onto a piece of wood. I could have printed a whole thing, but you know why? Uh, if battery backup in that, uh, if the power goes out or I unplug it and want to move it. It'll run on this 9-volt battery, but it, it doesn't charge the 9-volt battery. Uh, but it'll run that on that 9-volt battery for a zillion years. Uh, it takes a fair amount of power because it's running a GPS receiver and a microprocessor, so it would have a finite life, but it'll last long enough for a power outage or to move it. There's the controls to control the, uh, the clock. Uh, make it, uh, if I push the fast button, the second hand will go fast about three times faster. So the little pulses going to it just come three times faster, and uh, and when I let up on this that on the fast it just stops and waits for me to push the start button, and then it will start on the next one second pulse. And there's the little GPS receiver. There are the two little chips, and a power supply because I like to run this on 12 volts because like every good ham I've got 12 volts all over the place, and Anderson connectors. <laughs> so anyway, I'm there. And so now we'll uh, look at the clock and see if it actually works. Is there anything else I want to say in here? I think not. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, this is WWV. I'm assuming I don't need to tell you about that. And then here are the clocks. We'll listen to the timing. At the tone, zero hours, three minutes, coordinated universal time. Every time I see that, I get a kick out of it. <laughs> Alrighty, that's the project. If there's any questions, uh, well, contact me. Okay. We'll do this one more time just because it's cool to see. Alrighty.
day 73s everyone bye all right that sounds like a really fun little project and and uh something that we can all have fun with if we want to look into it uh next one is uh clint turner and i'll let him introduce what he's going to talk about. I, I did have one question for Ron just before we dashed off to Clint. So Ron, that GPS module that you're using, does yeah. that, I, I guess it has good reception inside the building. You don't, oh, you, yeah. it's, it's sitting here on a shelf, it's sitting here on a shelf in the, uh, in the ham shack. And, uh, it, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's amazing. In fact, when I was first working on it, I'd had it in the other room that was hundred miles <laughs> you know, inside the house, deep in the house, it still worked. Those things are, they blow me away how well they work. So if you, if you momentarily lost your, your connection to the GPS, would, would the clock still go or would they resynchronize or, or how, how, I, what I, would happen? My, my, my software is very, very simple. If I lost the GPS, it lost its one second pulse, the clock had quit. You okay. So if you lost one second, even one second, then you'd have to re recalibrate. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make this thing work. I was not trying to make something that's really hard and, and, and you know, reasonable. No. This was just, well, it, oh, let's see if I can do it. No, it works. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been running for, you know, a month or so. It's just right on every time. Yeah, if I lost a pulse, it would, it would screw it up. But it's pretty easy to reset it. Yeah. I, I just did not go to the trouble of having it to, you know, fix itself if it lost pulses. That, that requires writing more code. Okay. And Chuck, I, I didn't. I, I I looked at your picture. I go say you're gonna think I plagiarized your pictures. No, I took I took my own pictures. <laughs> See, I I want to mention that in the original in the video, the clock is exactly a matching WWB, but it got out of sync on Zoom. So, but so it is exactly on. Anyway. I guess, uh, Bruce, uh, any other questions or should I go, Bruce? Well, I don't see anybody uh, uh, jumping in there with questions. Should we embarrass Glenn? What now? He wants to know if we should embarrass Glenn, who well, was uh, leaning back in his chair asleep. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, why not? He's fun to embarrass. All right, well, I'm gonna start my uh, projects here. All right, um, a lot of you have probably seen this page before, as you probably know, I have something to do with the Northern Utah Web SDR. So consequently, some of my homebrew projects have been related to that. So, um, and the first one I'll mention has to do with this too. You might recognize that as a monstrous beam. It's uh, 80 feet up in the air and it's 85 feet long and it's pointed east. And it wouldn't surprise you to know that on 40 meters, it, it gets monstrous signal levels from shortwave broadcast stations in the Midwest and east that are literally radiating millions of watts in our direction. In fact, there are probably times of the day where you could hook an LED across the beam and watch it glow just from the RF that's coming across it. So what has happened is, what had happened was that the 40 meter receiver on the beam was overloading at times. And you only need to look at the band plan of the short wave bands to realize why that is because um, 40 meters goes from 7.0 to 7.3 and right at 7.3 on up, is where the superpower stations go uh, appear. So what do you do about uh, trying to keep that stuff out of a 40 meter receiver from getting the daylights overloaded out of it? So what do you do is you build a filter and uh, and not wanting to, just wanting to test the concept. This is my prototype filter bench. This is literally a scrap of plywood with self-adhesive uh, copper attached to it. And I just build the filter with inductors and junk capacitors and a few things just to see if it would work. And it actually did work. So I built what I refer to as the curiously sharp 40 meter bandpass filter to keep these super power stations from just absolutely clobbering everything. This is built into a die cast box and with the requisite in and out connectors. And the inside of it looks like this. Um, this is tin plated number 12 wire. and I 
and I had to make it that heavy because of the losses. And then these are a fairly big toroids. And then these are all tweaked and uh, finessed, you know, hold your tongue right and everything for the filter to, to be tuned right. And that's what the ultimate goal result is. Uh, this, this number six here and the number seven here are the edges of the 40 meter band. And down over here is, uh, is just 6.8, 6.8 or 6.9 meg, and this is a, a seven and a half meg right here. So when you get outside the 40 meter handband, things just go away really fast. And that is what is needed. I wasn't even sure I could even construct a filter like this to keep the receivers from being overloaded. Another thing that we needed up at the uh, web SDR site is we have UPSs, as you can imagine. And one of the things that I've built several places things for, and I have them around here. This is a simple transfer type switch. All it is is there's a relay down here and this has an outlet and two cords in it. So when the cord A gets power, this the light for A goes on, the relay engages and the outlets are connected to cord A. However, if the cord A's power disappears, it clunks over and connects over to cord B, which means that we can plug all our UPS, all our loads on the UPS into this box. And if we need to fix the UPS, we just unplug A, it goes clunk and transfers it to B, which we probably just plug into a wall or it could be another UPS like we have at Lemington. So we have redundant UPSs and, and it works. Uh, and so we can transfer the loads without dumping them. Now this worked pretty well, except that at, Lem at, at um, at uh, Corinne, where the web SDR site was for the past couple of years, we've been getting approximately 125 volts. Um, it goes up to about 135 volts and down to about 80 volts. So things always constantly going on and off UPSs. And we blew up three UPSs so far. Um, and, you know, we lost the, our most recent UPS is when the line voltage is probably around 160 volts for, for hours at a time. So it, in it, uh, so it blew up the UPS and blew fuses and everything on and tr on transformers. So we got another UPS, but it also tended to weld the contacts on this relay. And the reason was is it was just beating it to death. So I built a slightly fancier version than this one, and you can see the schematic of the of the simple one. And all this is is a double pole, double throw relay. So you're transferring your both your hot and neutral to your load separately. And in this particular case, I just used a 120 volt relay. But in this case, you could just use a, uh, you could also just use like a 24 volt transformer, 12 volt transformer and use a 12 volt relay. But I found a 120 volt relay kicking around to use. It was rated for 10 amps, but it wasn't good enough. So I built this monster, which is slightly bigger. You can see by the size, it's just built in one of those uh, J boxes you get at Lowe's Depot. And inside um, these, these there it is. I got this big monster contactor. It's uh, you know from uh, what is it? It's a Dayton contactor from Gray Bar, and there's a little circuit board here too in the transformer. And this what this does is if the voltage is below 90 volts or 100 volts, it will never engage this relay. But if it is above there, it takes a while to charge the capacitor. And this little blue relay will then turn on this big relay, which makes a nice, uh, satisfying thud as it pulls in. So if the power goes away on the UPS, it un 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 disconnects immediately and goes to the B, B side. But if the power comes back, but the power is not good because the UPS is ramping up slowly as the UPS, modern UPSs do, it takes about two or three seconds for, before the voltage stabilizes, before this thing goes, makes the satisfying clunk. And the schematic of it's relatively simple. I have it on my blog page in case you're worried about it, but all it is is just a little voltage detector here and big capacitors that take a while to charge up, turn on this relay, which turns on this relay. And that's, uh, and that, that allows us to uh, use the UP, uh, work on the UPSs without dumping the whole web SDR side. Now, one of the other things we wanted to do too is we wanted to know what the voltage is at the web SDR site. So I built this doohickey. Um, this is the outside of it. As you can guess, it, it monitors temperature, humidity, and the power line. And it does something else. Um, 
it also, because it uses a microprocessor, I just had it key a, a, a 28.57 megahertz oscillator for the amplifier. So it sends more stonometry. And if you go to 28.57 on the Utah SDR, you can hear those Morris just bounding away, telling all things like line voltage and temperature and all that. Now the guts of it is this, one of these ESP8266 modules, you can get two of these suckers for uh, 12 bucks delivered from Amazon, maybe cheaper. And it plugs right into the Arduino development library. So just you just select the device and it plugs into a USB port and you can throw a code into it. It has built-in Wi-Fi on it and has one A to D input so it can read voltage and a bunch of pins going out. And there actually, it actually was really slick. It, from the time I took it out of the wrapper to got, I got the code running, reading humidity it was like a half hour, including all the soldering. Uh, I didn't put it on this board, I just tacked wires to it. And, and this is one of the ubiquitous uh, uh, DHT22 sensors. These are dirt cheap, they'll measure temperature and humidity. So we now can measure the temperature and humidity inside the building. And we discovered, of course, it was getting to be like 120 degrees in the building, which we knew. And this is the actual 10 meter transmitter. This oscillator runs all the time. And this transistor keys it. And this is a little low level RF amplifier and just runs to a piece of wire, literally a few inches of wire in the building, just is all we need to get the few tens of milliwatts out to the, uh, to the receive antenna. And this is the whole thing in the box. Um, this is a, uh, this is a 555 timer that is reset by pulses from the from the software coming from this uh, board. And the board crashes, the pulses go away, and after about a minute, this kicks this thing in the butt and it restarts. This calibrates the line voltage. There's two wall warts on this thing: one to power it that's plugged into UPS, and one of them that is just used to monitor the line voltage that is plugged into the not UPS. And so we have a uh, uh, a log on the web SDR that shows what all the power line voltage and the temperature was every five minutes uh, going back for months now since I put this online. And this is what the web page looks like. This is the screen that you, we can get. It's not public because we don't want people hammering it, but we can just go there and see this web page and it tells us all we want to know. And everything like that is also on. Uh, all this information is sent on. Uh, on CW as well, except for the, uh, I think the seconds ago count. So there you go. Uh, one way we can monitor what the, what's happening in the building and the line voltage. And you can see today, our power is still kind of dirty. I dipped down to 105 volts uh, at some point. We don't know when, except by looking at the uh, logs. And it was only up to 119. They recently replaced a lot of the power out, power lines out there. So our voltage is, now roughly 120 instead of uh, moving over a huge uh, window. So those are three relatively quick projects did for the web SDR site, which as you can imagine, needs a lot of work all the time to keep everything running. And I will send it back to you, Bruce. Doesn't want to unmute. There it is. Yeah, it looks like a lot of thought going into it and a lot of playing around with different filters and trying to get it to to work right for us. Did Gary ever log in? I was just checking and I haven't seen Gary yet. All right. Well, with that, we're uh, uh, we're going to basically call it an evening because it's after nine o'clock and uh, uh, I'd invite you to the after meeting at the restaurant, but we're not meeting that way anymore. So <laughs> one of these days we're gonna be able to get together and spend a few minutes with each other. Uh, I remind you that the next meeting is next month and we're gonna have some good information on how to put together a, a functional ham shack with Gordon and we're going to possibly see some some interesting things there. Uh, remember everybody to 
Look out for the microvolt and I'll see you on the air per se. And uh, have a good evening. This is KF70ZK and uh, I'm going to say 73s. All right. Um, thank you, Bruce. And uh, with that, uh, any uh, last comments in the uh, in the chat on on YouTube? We'll hang around just for another minute or so. But uh, thank every uh, I'm, thanks everyone who was able to present. Looks like Blake had to go. His time was a bit limited, but we appreciate him checking in from uh about red baton louisiana and also ron from tucson good to see ron again uh and everyone else on here uh, let's see it uh, just go back past the comments a little hi, bit lane. <laughs> hi lane uh, uh let's see uh david sauce mentions that amazon sells a clock that synchronizes with an echo by means of bluetooth be interesting to hack. I'm sure somebody has already, but it's to make it show whatever you want. Yeah, I, and, I would never recommend anybody do this project I did. It was just fun to do, totally useless, you know. It was, well, way better. It was fun. There are better ways to do it, you know. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> no, it was worth it to listen to Ron giggle at the top of every <laughs> minute for about two days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> People are much missing. <laughs> And, and, and I guess it doesn't take much to uh, you know, just just a clock put a clock in front of it and keep them happy. Right? <laughs> keep them happy. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you too, Elaine. Um, anyway, we'll wrap the meeting up again. Thank you for everyone showing up. Watch out for the microphone and be here next month at the same bad time and same bad YouTube channel.